Next up, I want to introduce two men that need absolutely no introduction because we have Tim Draper and Timo Aupelto coming up on stage. Tim Draper is said to be the inventor of virality itself. His company, DFJ, was also one of the early investors in Skype. And Timo Aupelto from Lifeline Ventures is also doesn't need an introduction. He is the man that knows everything there is to know about the Finnish startup scene, also investor in Supercell. So please come on up on stage. Woo! Either way. Welcome, guys. Yeah. Glad to have you here. Yeah. Hope Good. you have a really good, good and exciting talk. Welcome. Please Can sit down. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, they hear me. If you want okay. some water or anything, yeah. relax. No, I'm good. Yeah, okay. We're Great. very Morris. homey here. So yeah. No. yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'll leave you guys to it. This is one of the least ergonomic chairs I have ever sat on. So. Yeah, I, I wonder, <laughs> hey, should we, sit, should we stand? Then they can see us in the back. You want to stand? stand? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, we yeah, should. We stand, We're yeah. only here for, yeah, what, 40 yeah. minutes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because okay. sitting if actually... You get, if you get tired, we'll sit there. Yeah, okay. okay, so sitting actually kills you, right? right. <laughs> That's what they say these days. Hey, uh, let's get straight to the topic. So, I've always wanted to ask from you is that, why Draper University? Is, oh, what is the best way to grow entrepreneurs? I mean, is it to teach them in a university or lead by example or what's the idea? So, um, whenever anybody says something can't be done, Something weird goes off in my head and says, how, how could it happen? If you, if, you know, what would you have to do to make it possible? Um, I hear the word impossible a lot here in Europe, and I, I want you to get rid of that in your vocabulary. Um, but people used to say, you can't teach entrepreneurship. It's like innate. Um, so whenever I heard that, I kept thinking, well, how would you teach entrepreneurship? And I'm pretty sure the way you teach entrepreneurship is not by teaching them about how all these other entrepreneurs did their thing. That might help them emotionally, but I don't think it helps them get that drive, that fire to go out and do something yeah. great. So, um, so I decided I would start a school to basically um, show that you could actually teach entrepreneurship. So um, it's tough to get... To get into Draper University, you, you just have to have a real spark, a, a real passion for something. And then our job will be to ignite it and make you into a great entrepreneur or so, hero. So, so how are you actually measuring this passion in an entrepreneur? So how, how do you measure that? Is it just like you, you are looking at all the applicants and, and they pitch to you, or, and then you say that this guy has like 100% passion and this guy is 38%? So we have it. I, you know, I've trained an admissions office to do this for me, okay. but I do, um, when it's on the margin or something, I do get involved. Um, what, what they're looking for is somebody who's totally maybe obsessed with one thing or very knowledgeable about a lot of things. Or, uh, so either you're really deep in one area or you're very good horizontally. That, those are the two, area, two ways we think we can find interesting passion. Um, so you just, it doesn't matter. You could be passionate about water bottles. It would not matter. Uh, we're just looking for something where you really are into it and you really want to make a big change. And, and about the age, I mean, I've always wondered that, uh, I mean, Finland, we discussed here, Finland is like a semi-socialist country, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I've been about always to, hey, I need to get my kids' classroom to talk about being an entrepreneur, but I'm a little bit in a way that, hey, if I go there, they think that I'm some type of a capitalist, you know, teaching small kids how to make. There's somebody laughing. It's a good sign you kind of uh, come with the same background. But, but what is the right age? I mean, is it 10 years, 15 years, 18 years? And, and is there a point after which you are kind of a lost soul already? Um. I don't think there should, I, I think the age should be right off the bat. I, people should understand that, hey, if you figure out a business that can make money, you're doing a lot of people a lot of good. You're spreading something that people care about. Um, I think socialist governments take our creativity away, and they also take our humanity away. And so I think you, I think as, as a human, you, you really want to be creative. You want to be, and, and when you're the youngest, that's when you're the most creative. We lose our creativity over time if we don't really train that muscle. Um, 
I, I've been going from Eastern to Western Europe, Eastern to Western Europe for the last two weeks, and, and all I've noticed is that the socialist countries have all the buildings are exactly the same and the people are a little bit more depressed. Um, I, I look at the, the countries that have free markets and I say, they're doing well, everything's good, and they're generally pretty happy because they, they have found proactive work to do that wasn't told to them by some government. So whether you call it socialism or whatever, the top down where a government thinks it knows better what the people should be doing than the people do, I think you run into real problems. But, but I do believe that in a very active free market, people will lose their jobs and be lost. So I actually do believe in some sort of a basic income thing, and I've been exploring that. It's interesting, Switzerland is yeah, doing yeah. that and some other countries. We are trying to do that, but we, probably the politicians don't have enough courage to put it in action, but there's a lot of talk about that. Well, it, it's interesting because it ends up being a much more efficient way to, ha to manage your welfare and your social security, your unemployment. Yeah, I agree. And, um, and, and with the new technologies you can take advantage of, uh, it's, it, it makes for a much better government uh, because you can do it with just Bitcoin and the blockchain. You get it, give everybody a Bitcoin address, or a wallet address, and with one button you can send everybody their weekly salary or their bi-weekly salary. Yeah. Hey, um, maybe a little bit odd question, but uh, what worries you most in the world? So what are you most worried about? Or is it a you know, stupid you may question? Have, you may have hit on it. Um, I think government control worries me the most. In, but, in but the, the U.S. That, or yeah, everywhere? Yeah, in the U.S., everywhere, where the government thinks it knows better for its people than the people do. Um, I think the thing that, um, that gives me the best hope, though, is that now governments are going to have to compete with each other for us. If your government isn't doing a really good job, you can go down to Estonia and they've got a really awesome government there. You, if, you, um, if, if your government is, uh, I mean, we're very mobile now. We can go, we can move. And, uh, and, and we just carry these uh, mobile phones with us and our computer. I mean, I can, I can set up anywhere. Yeah, this is actually a really good point. So if there's any like government guys in the audience, uh, I, I think that you just, hit the nail on the head, I mean, the current generations or the entrepreneurs who are kind of teaching in the heroes thing, I mean, those guys are going to go where they have the best possibilities to build the companies. And I'm also a great believer that uh, the companies, no matter how evil they can be about making money for the owners and, and, and et cetera, they are the ones that are kind of a turning the wheel right now and can do a lot of good. And, and, and the, every company Today, I mean, you, you invested in Google, and let's talk about that in a while. Uh, every company these days is founded by two or three or one like spectacular individual. And that individual can freely move wherever he or she wants. And okay, that is so, something that government so, in Finland at least doesn't get. Okay, so I, I got a little, my mind just went black when, when you said that, that it's evil somehow to, for a, a business to think you a little bit. <laughs> in, in, encourage to make money. I think if you're a business and you're not making money, that's a problem. If you are a nonprofit and you are not sustainable, you're just dragging on the heartstrings of rich people, you are not doing society a favor. What you are, when you are doing society a favor, it's when you are making enough money so that you, you've got real customers and they're willing to pay real money for your service and it spreads all the way around the world because you built this business. So as an entrepreneur, you have a responsibility to make as much money as you can so that you can spread your product as far, as far around the world as you can. And those people who become super rich, they are awesome and we should honor them. Yeah, you are getting a lot of high fives. I, I don't know if you are realizing so. <laughs> that went very well, down very well. So it was good, so that's like a good view. Hey, um, we actually have a one investment in common. It's a company called Inivo that is doing waste management logistics. So basically telling when the bins need to be emptied so the trucks are not driving in vain around the you know, areas. And, uh, and, and, and then you invested in a company called Compology in the US as yeah. well. So tell me the story. 
you, you, you started when we met there down that you guys got really angry about, you know, me investing in your competitor, right? right. And, and, and then you were smiling and saying that you are totally cool with it. And I said that I'm as well. But that, tell me the story because it was interesting and it gets back to your Google story. Yeah. So technology moves very quickly. So as a venture capitalist, if, if I invest in one company and I say, I'll never invest in anybody who's a competitor, um, I'll be out of business. Uh, we, we at Draper, uh, well, Draper Associates, but also at DFJ, um, we backed uh, six search engines. And I, I met the guys at Google on an airplane, and I, I brought that to my partnership, and I said, these guys are fantastic. It, we really should back them. My partner said, no, they're competitive. We've already got six search engines in the portfolio. They're directly competitive with one of our companies and we should not back them. So we ended up not backing Google as a result of this competitive thing. So when I saw Enevo, and I saw how exciting it was, I backed him. And then about two weeks later, just randomly, another entrepreneur came in with the same idea in the US, and uh, although they're slightly different, they do go after the same market. Yeah, that's market. right. Different segments, slightly um, differently. And, I agree. And I backed him too. So I just want you to know, if I back you, I might be backing your competitor in a year or two because they may be moving ahead faster, whatever. But I can, but, but I, yeah, but they are compologies, not moving faster. So no, no, they're about, they're, they're both rocking about the same <laughs> thing. But I'll tell you one other thing that makes me feel good about this. Um, Back in 1981, there were 81. Yeah, there were three software companies in the world, and they were considered directly competitive with one another. They are Microsoft, Lotus, Activision. Okay, they don't really compete. Microsoft actually did sort of rip Lotus's heart out at one point, but um, but Activision is an entirely different game business. Uh, yeah. So I, I kind of feel like uh, you want to back people and those people will take those businesses. If they see an interesting opportunity, they'll take those businesses in different directions and everybody ends up winning, particularly the consumer. Yeah, that's right. Hey, a um, few technologies I want to just if you give your quick comment and, and these, some of these are really obvious, but I need to start from from uh, one of the things that you are very well known, so viral marketing today. Yeah. <laughs> so the guys who, if, if, no, if there's still anybody who doesn't know, so Tim is claimed to be the inventor of viral marketing. So if you tell the story in a couple of minutes and tell, do you think that viral marketing is over right now? Because uh, at least with the games companies, we, it's, it's increasingly difficult to build viral on, on you know, App Store because it's so cluttered already. So any comments and tell, tell us the story. Did you really invent it or not? Yeah, I did. Um, what happened was uh, I backed Hotmail and I was in the board meeting with Hotmail and, uh, and I, I, they said it's up and it was running. And then I said, um, well, how are you going to market it? And they said, well, we're going to put um, billboards up and TV ads and all sorts. He had big images of him, so, you know, of Hotmail everywhere. And I said, I said, well, we, we didn't give you very much money. I don't, I'm not sure how you're going to get any TV time with that. And then I said, um, can't you just get it out to this web thing? And the web was all uh, just academics and military. And, and I said, can't you just put it on that, that internet? And they said, they said, no, that would be spamming. Apparently, there was already an anti-spamming law there, and, uh, or at least a, a, a culture of anti-spamming. Yeah. And then, then I said, well, what if, OK, you guys have decided to give this software away for free. What if you put a little message at the er bottom of everybody's screen? It says, PS, I love you. Get your free email at Hotmail. And, um, and they said uh, they didn't like it. They thought it was a bad idea. And, and I kept pounding and I said, well, can you do it? Is it physically possible to put something there? And uh, I, I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Finally, I said, okay, okay, we'll do it, but no PS, I love you. Just get your free email at Hotmail. Now, to this day, I think we'd have a much more peaceful and loving world if they'd kept PS, I love you. But 
Um, in any viral, case, viral marketing in today. any case, that was the first of the viral marketing. Um, now, the way I came up with it, though, was that um, at Harvard Business School, I read a case on Tupperware, how the women would create, if you wanted to buy Tupperware, you yeah. had to create a party of Tupperware. I know, so it's very popular in Finland. So you had to sell it to your friends, and then they had to sell it to their friends and their friends. And so I thought about uh, Hotmail spreading that way. I'd send you an email, you'd send it to your friends, they'd send it to their friends. Pretty soon we've reached everybody in the world. And that's what happened. Um, and Hotmail became, I guess, there were a billion users of Hotmail at its peak. Um, now Gmail, similar thing, they've got many, I, several billion, I think. Um, so we've really made it so that the whole world can communicate very well. And you asked whether viral marketing's dead. Well, now it's called growth hacking, or it's called, uh, they got a lot of words for it, but, but the whole idea is make your customer your sales force. And if you can make your customer your sales force, you will build something of great value. As long as your customer's out there promoting you, it's better than you promoting it yourself. And, um, and the other piece that's happened because of a couple things, since there, we're all able to communicate everywhere around the world, we can force governments to compete with each other because our geographic borders have fallen. And distribution of a new idea or a new invention can spread around the world much faster than ever before. So I do recommend something I saw uh, uh, in the pitch sessions today, a lot of companies that were really focused just on the Finnish market, tiny market. This is a big world and I highly recommend that if you've got something that works in Finland, that you spread it around the world because it's easy, distribution is commoditizing, it's going to be great. That's like the that's like a really good piece of advice. Like, I highly recommend that you go outside of Finland with your business. Right. I, I'm, I'm just like so shocked you made me, you know, see black that are there really companies who are considering Finland as their market? I mean, well, there were a few. Uh, up yeah, there. okay, all yeah. right. So the ones who are still like thinking that way, I think, you know, the borders are, have fallen, like you said. Yeah. Hey, um, artificial intelligence, uh, are the machines going to kill us? You know, I think they're, uh, the machines are going to help us. Here, somebody asked me, um, he said, it, it, it was a press person, first he asked me, how many um, years before you have self-driving cars out there? And, and uh, I said, I don't know, one or two, it shouldn't be too long. And then he said, how long before humans are no longer allowed to drive on the roads? <laughs> and it started me thinking, I said 10 or 15, but but it started me thinking that no, it, actually the robots are going to help us get around, move, whatever. And, um, and I think also artificial intelligence is going to help us take back our control of our health care. Uh, you know, all that data is going to be up in the cloud. We're going to have much better intelligence on how to treat certain uh, ailments. Um, I think, I think uh, AI is going to permeate every part of society and just make it so that we're more effective at what we do. I mean, I'm going to use AI to evaluate uh, companies. Although, what I'm going to probably do is figure out, you know, what works and then invest in things that just don't fall into any category at all. Yeah. So how about then uh, Mars? Uh, do we need to inhabit Mars? So, um, I, you know, my, my fifth grade teacher, I was 10 years old, and she said, the, the world is going to come to the, come to an end in 10,000 years. And I went, what? <laughs> and, and I don't know whether she's trying to freak us out or what, but it got me thinking that we really do need to go out and explore other territories as potential uh, places to, to go inhabit. Um, and, uh, and we've made a couple of interesting investments in SpaceX and and in, uh, in Planet Labs, the, the uh, yeah. satellite company. And we're just really pushing space. There's another one that, uh, that's actually going to be ion drives. If you guys have ever seen Star Trek, I mean, they're creating ion drives. Um, and there's, they said, we're the, we're the great hope at getting us all to Alpha Centauri, yeah, uh, yeah. Pla the planets on Alpha, around Alpha Centauri. So. Um, 
I actually do believe that we need to explore space and move out there and try. And you know, when somebody says, Elon Musk is one of the great entrepreneurs of the world, and one of the reasons is he says, we're going to Mars. And 95% of the people think, oh, he's crazy. And then the other 5% think, how are we going to help him get us to Mars? And the best engineers in the world and the best cleverest biologists, and the, they all want to join him. And so having big aspirations like that is really good for entrepreneurs. Yeah, I totally agree. I have this theory that the probability of success is constant in your company. So it means that even if you, high, if you aim like a super high, that's going to attract like a best engineers, best investors, best talent. So your probability is the same if you aim low, because then you get like a B or C or D level kind of a people to work on it. So. <laughs> It's very interesting. We used to, at, at DFJ, and one of the reasons that I um, started working at Draper Associates doing my own investing, was we would sit around the table with 12 very, very smart people, and if they all agreed, then we'd all fund it. Yeah. But, but likely, that meant the business is too late, because if everybody thinks this is a good idea, then it's too late. We were always the most successful if one or two people were really passionate about it and the, then the others were just kind of uh, maybe passionately against it. Yeah. It, it turns out that the, the best uh, uh, measure of, of potential success was the decibel level in the room when we were yeah. discussing it. So uh, that's actually right. I mean. There's a lot of VCs and, and investors who are making this consensus decision. So you get these 12 partners and you only invest if everybody agrees. And I, I, I'm on your camp in this. It's more about that if, if somebody who has a track record and good brain and, and is you know, passionate about something, even if the rest 11 disagree, I mean, it's probably some, a shot to be taken. Yeah, you, and you take it. We're lucky because we're in a business where we can be wrong more than we're right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, still, we get to keep being in yeah. the business. <laughs> so how about uh, artificial, uh, you know, augmented reality or virtual reality? Which one is going to be bigger? Well, I think ultimately, um, it, it will be a, an AR, VR device. Yeah. So you'll start with AR and you'll go around your day and you'll say, oh, hi, you know, Timo. And, and then up on my device, it'll be going, oh, and your wife, Gertrude, you know, and your children, good to know, and, and all of the tips will be here. Yeah. I won't be in my brain. And you'll think, oh, what a nice guy. He knows my family. Yeah. And, uh, and so- Oh, what a scary guy. He has to take, you know, he knows my family. That's right, <laughs> or either way. Um, but it, in business, you'll, you'll be doing the same thing. You'll say, oh, this is this person, and this is what they're doing. And, then you can kind of like just move your hand or something and then you can bring up their, their uh, annual budget and, your, and their business model and whatever else, a description of their business, whatever, and you can read that. You can also sort of, as you're driving, potentially be entertained even if you're not, but you should keep your eyes on the road. Um, but then I think you will flip into VR maybe when the day is done and you're saying, hey, I've, I just want to relax, you'll go into another world. You'll, maybe it'll be your way of getting exercise. It'll be your way of um, seeing another world. By the way, if you haven't tried VR, wow. Try yeah, you it. need to try it. It is yeah. crazy fun. It's just amazing. And, and so many things are going to happen with it. It'll change education. It'll change. Um, uh, change your travel. You will actually VR travel, I think. It'll change your perspective on the space, whatever. My son started something called Boost.VC, and it's like the leading accelerator for VR and AR. Yeah. He also does Bitcoin and blockchain. But um, if you're in that field, it's a good idea to apply to that because you'll be with 20 or 30 other people who are all working on it together are working on it separately, but you'll have all of those contacts together um, and you kind of live and breathe with them for about three months. It's actually a great program. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's so many opportunities right now. I mean, you said that back in the 80s, there were three software companies and, and when you listen, some people, you know, they thought that, hey, you know, 
when the PC was invented that it's kind of over so the opportunities and we have already listed few and how about then the health and computation or computer science kind of at that intersection how do you see that I mean it's, what's your opinion yeah, I mean, there's too kidding. many things to invest already <laughs> even yeah, in this short true. fireside but, um, uh, the uh, the healthcare world I think is really going through some major changes um, and it's going to have resistance and I'll tell you how this works if you have something really extraordinary and you break into an industry you are going to really affect that industry and that industry is going to fight back and you've got to be prepared for that and you've got to overcome it and then become a big business so I'll give you my example here well first just to give you examples Napster got attacked by the music industry uh, Uber got attacked by the cabs uh, Skype was attacked by the, uh, the long distance carriers the, um, uh, Tesla was attacked by the, uh, the big three auto companies anyway we, we have a company that we invested in this woman came to me she, said, she was 19 years old she said I'm going to change healthcare as we know it it was called Theranos and she, she uh, takes two drops of blood runs it through a microfluidic chamber, runs 50 blood tests for you so that you don't get the vampires taking your blood like for every test. And, and then she takes that data from those, that microfluidic chamber, puts it up into the cloud so, and it, so that you can compare it last year to this year, this year to next year. You can compare how your blood is changing but then you can apply that to, you can add it to your DNA test with 23andMe or you can uh, add it to your Fitbit or to your body bug and then suddenly a real profile starts to come as a healthcare profile and then with that healthcare profile I believe that you will be able to tell the doctor more about what you have than the doctor will know or the doctor will be able to look at that profile and say oh we can't give you penicillin we give you this other antibiotic or you should only be you know using probiotics while you're uh, uh, while you're feeling healthy because uh, no antibiotic works for you or something like that so I think healthcare is changing in a big way and it's going to be very much data oriented, big data oriented and uh, statisticians will do, do, do well in that world. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if, if you look at healthcare today, the, for example, all the research is done in a way that you have a super highly controlled small samples. And I also believe that it's going to be like still high quality but more loosely controlled big data and it's a really big change. I mean. Wherever I go and talk to these healthcare leaders, they are just like saying that no, Timo, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the data is going to be so much more powerful and we are going to accumulate it so much faster. I mean, I'm investing in biotech as well. And it kind of takes four years to set up a phase one trial to test if something is not toxic. And that's like kind of a there's a lot of regulation so 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 that's good that connects me with the rest of this uh, Theranos story because what's happened with Theranos is the incumbents have come after them with everything they have lawsuits uh, they, they somehow got some writer for the Wall Street Journal to just continually pound on Theranos and then they've got the um, the uh, government now going and, and inspecting everything they do in their labs which is amazing because the other people who take your blood are not even FDA approved so it's sort of like the gang has decided that this is threatening to their world and they're going to come after it with everything they've got but eventually it changes the world changes and people have to adapt so but think about healthcare the the AMA, all the doctors don't necessarily like this because they lose their power over the patient. Uh, the drug companies, they don't like this. They like the, the relationship they have with the government because th that, that FDA approval takes so long and is so painful and so expensive that only big pharma can make a, make a drug go all yeah. the way through it. And, and then government. The, the NIH and all of that is totally going to have to change because they've got to think in terms of like 
big data rather than these guys with their beakers and trying to, you know, see what chemicals work. Because we have a company that can actually take all, they can take the molecule that is the disease and then they can run all these simulations and they can be better predictors of efficacy and safety than the FDA. So things are going to start to change in a big way in healthcare and and the powers that be are going to fight it to the death, but they are going to eventually uh, have to adapt or die. Yeah. So, hey, we have covered some of these, like, uh, usual suspects. And, and this has been, like, really love your answers because they are so, you know, hitting the nail on the head. But how do you find areas that are not on the press, you know, that are not on the Wall Street Journal? So how do you kind of uh, get back to your hotmail kind of a thing in a way that the Internet was for academics? And I mean... In the 80s, uh, you know, ni even 90s, I mean, if you say that it's the main driver of, you know, economic growth, people would be thinking that you are crazy. So it's for academia and it's, it's for military. So, so what's next? So how do you find this? I mean, do you go to campuses and look what the nerds do or? Yeah, I, um, I come here. Uh, I travel all over the world, look for business plan competitions. I try to see what kind of things are happening in various cultures see if things are, are relevant to various markets that people may not have uh, seen. Um, and then at Draper University, I attract people who have a real spark for something, and then, um, and then we train them in a new way. Um, most schools are really uh, for people to you know, take down notes and, and make sure that they don't make any mistakes. But it turns out all the greatest discoveries in the world have happened by mistake. The electricity, uh, penicillin, Velcro, Hotmail, uh, all these things happen because weird things came together. Uh, so at Draper University, we, uh, we honor failure. Uh, we honor extraordinary behavior and failure. And uh, so, give me an example of extraordinary behavior. So, does it mean what does it mean in practice? So, what's the most extraordinary behavior? So, what's good about that Drake, has turned into success that you have seen, or kind of uh, emerging? Oh, the successes yeah. are are coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, we're, something we're, where we're you still see a pretty that, young school, but we have yeah, but now. Um, I'll just give you a little bit yeah. of the background. We have uh, now had about five or six hundred students that have come through and they've started 240 different companies. Um, they've come from 70 different countries and so there's lots of that kind of interesting cultural interaction yeah. that goes on. And then, um, and then when they're there, uh, everything's team-based. So when, when people go to Draper University, they're not looking out as much for themselves as they are for their team of five people. That team of five people, they have to kind of live and die by, they're stuck with them. And people will drag other people along depending on what the, what the challenge is. Uh, but we'll have these challenges like a Rube Goldberg experiment where you, you try to do something very simple with the most complicated device you possibly can to make that one thing happen. Or, uh, or we'll have, have people have to land an egg on the third floor, or we, we, or we have robot wars. Um, and, the, and the building itself is solid concrete, so it's very unlikely for anything to be really disastrous, but uh, we do make you sign your life away to come because uh, where all schools are always working on your safety and security, uh, we're actually uh, proud to say that we're a dangerous school. Uh, and I encourage you to think, are you willing to be in a dangerous school? Uh, weird things will happen here, um, and I'm hoping that it doesn't, that the explosions aren't big enough to blow up the entire building. Uh, but it, we really are trying to, to get people to try things they never would try before, but then we ask them to clean up afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some of the companies that have come out of there, um, two have uh, recently made it through FDA approval. Uh, one, a woman had a, uh, has a uh, device. She, in order to test her ovary, which was uh, inf inflated ovary, I guess, um, she, uh, they needed to destroy her ovary to see whether she had cancer in her ovary. 
So she created a device that was very ultra thin and with a, a, um, a fiber line that goes up into the fallopian tube and does not damage the fallopian tu tube. And she just got FDA approval for it. So that's sort of pretty awesome. Um, another woman uh, noticed that in China they, they have this feeling like uh, there's no one to talk to about their emotional problems. And so she ended up uh, connecting all of the people with emotional problems to all of the um, professionals yeah. in China. And that company has done very well. Um, and those, those both came out of some real boldness that came from being at Draper University. Yeah, yeah. Neither of those companies would have been started if they hadn't gone through our process. So what do you find the teachers? I need to ask because so do you train the teachers or you handpick them or do they apply for you or so that's great. you pick the first two and they grew the next four? Or? Okay, so again, this is one of those reasons why we're not accredited because accredited schools always have to teach history and so we teach future instead and other accredited schools have to have three full-time tenured professors we instead have 50 speakers that come through and tell their their experience or what they're really good at um, but but our our teachers have been like uh elon musk uh brought all our students over to see the s car be launched yeah and he um and he gave them some of the best advice ever. And that was, somebody asked, well, Mr. Musk, Mr. Musk, what, what if I want to be a, uh, an entrepreneur? What do you recommend? And he looks at her, he's sweating. He's, look, he's thinking, oh my God, I got this big launch. I can't believe what I've done. It's unbelievable. He goes, don't do it. <laughs> and he said, basically, that's the best advice I can give you because if I tell you don't do it and you still want to do it, you're, you're an entrepreneur, you're in there for the game. Um, anyway, we've had the founders of Uber and Airbnb and uh, uh, Solar City and uh, Zappos and, uh, and they, they come through as founders and then we have specific experts coming through. Yeah. So what, what we're not doing is having people read about what somebody wrote, about what they heard, from somebody who heard, from somebody who did it, we're hearing from the person who did it. Great. Hey, this has been like a super pleasure. Now you have a final word if you, you can send greetings back home or to your wife or some, anything you want. So, <laughs> so what, what would be your advice to everybody in the audience in addition to don't do it? <laughs> okay, so don't do it if you still want to do it, then I would recommend a couple of things. One is be bold. So be bold. Don't do it and be bold and when be you're bold. still doing it. Any, anything is possible. So anything you, um, you can imagine can happen. Now, I've, I've, I'm old enough to know, having grown up looking at Star Trek and thinking that all of that was science fiction, I'm old enough to know that most of that stuff has happened. It's just freaky. So anything you can imagine can happen. Um, and for, for Europeans, I think um, anything is possible. And if anybody uses the word impossible or, um, or let's be reasonable or realistic, call them on it. Get rid of those words. Those words aren't good for you. They aren't good for society. Think in terms of ideas, passions, imagination. Get those things going because if you can imagine it, you can eventually get there. It, it, it'll take your lifetime, but you can get there. So, uh, so imagine it and don't let anybody stop you. And then the other piece is make money and be proud of it. Thanks, great advice. All right, good timing. This was great, thanks. That was great. Yeah.